Hello, this is Breuer, and welcome back to another First Impressions video for the Civilization VI New Frontier Pass. Today we're taking a look at Gaul, which is the second of the civilizations. We took a look at Byzantium, uh, was it last week? I guess it was. Um, so I haven't seen anything about this. This is a full First Impressions reaction, the works. All I've seen is this picture of this uh, this guy here looking pretty pretty aggressive with his tattoos and his spear. Uh, so let's see let's see what he's all about. Ambiotix leads Gaul in Sid Meier's Civilization VI. Far more than just a king of the north, Ambiotix was known as the king in all directions. He ruled the Obiron tribe in what is now Belgium. Gaul's powerful, unique ability is called Eilstadt culture. It allows mines to provide a minor adjacency bonus for all districts, culture bomb unknown territory, and grant additional culture. All right, so minor adjacency bonus for all districts. That that's that's significant. That's that's something. Um, I mean, that's that's good science. That's good culture. That's going to be good gold. Um, I mean, what other districts can benefit from production? Obviously, uh, which obviously it already gave production, so I guess that one doesn't count. Uh, and then the culture bomb. You can't go wrong with a good culture bomb. Culture bombs are always nice to have, especially for something like this. It's this easy to build. You're gonna be able to put mines out all over the place. So his his borders are gonna grow very very quickly. Obviously, he's gonna to want to be on some hilly terrain. Um, it very much makes sense to play Gaul on highlands. I don't really know anything else about him, but I mean, already you want a lots of hills. Go play highlands, and it makes sense for Gaul to me. Um, but then also, what was it? She says she gives us a little bit of culture as well. Uh, which actually we can see that on some of these mines, each of these mines has at least one culture. Some of them actually have two. Wonder what the differentiation is there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, pretty pretty um, versatile uh, bonus already. That is going to let you kind of spread out and do. I mean, no specific uh, victory type is it is it really touching on. It's really just kind of giving you a little bit of everything for just about any victory type. The downside to this power is that specialty districts cannot be built next to the city center. Oh, wow. Specialty districts cannot be built next to the city center. Huh. I mean, that, that already knocks off one good adjacency. I mean, the city center counts as a district. And so usually if you build a di one district next to your city center, you can just build a second one and you've got a little triangle of, of, of awesome adjacency for, for those. Um, that's that's definitely something. Uh, I'm not sure how this is going to play out in the game itself. I mean, it probably in the long run will be okay because you're going to still be able to get that adjacency back from the mines, presumably, assuming you have enough places for mines. But it is a little bit of a of an interesting and unique restriction. You already have that restriction with encampments. In fact, we can see that here in the bottom left-hand corner. Encampments already couldn't be built next to the city center. Now none of the districts can be. Uh, I mean, they can still be built next to each other, which will allow you to still have some sort of triangle of some sort. But it definitely... I mean, that's a lot of that's a lot of good real estate right there by your city center so and do not receive adjacency bonuses from other districts never mind <laughs> i just need to unpause oh my goodness do not receive adjacency bonus from other districts <laughs> okay so he's gonna have his district spread out all over the place so that he can have his mines between all of his districts which we saw in that picture it's definitely unique i mean it's not we haven't gotten very far. We're just the first bonus, but it's not the end of the world because it is, there's still some some value here. But you are, if you don't have mineable territory, you are going to be at a pretty significant disadvantage because not having the city center adjacency, not having any other district adjacency, there's not a lot of other adjacencies for a lot of these these um, you know districts. I mean, obviously, science centers can get uh, from the mountains. Uh, uh, holy sites can get from mountains. Uh, um, what am I trying to say? The uh, culture, goodness. Wow, mind blank of what they're actually called for a temporary, but theater districts, goodness. I'll be all right. Uh, they, you, you know, they get adjacency from what wonders and things like that. So there are still some other adjacencies I assume will be existing, but it seems to me like you're going to want to spread these out, have mines, you know, as many places all around them as you possibly can. And it really feels like where I thought for a second there, he was actually going to get a pretty decent bonus. It actually feels like it might be a little harder to get good adjacencies for your districts than than a lot of the other civilizations. So maybe it's actually not as good as it looked at first. We'll see. I mean, I will say this, though. Incentivizing you to build mines does mean he's going to have some pretty good production. 
Skull's unique unit is called the Gazette. It replaces the warrior and receives additional combat strength when fighting stronger units in district defenses. But All right, about to get to the butt. I heard a butt for a second there, but I mean, this is obviously really strong. Look at the 60 combat strength versus 34 for the spearman. That's a pretty significant boost. Um, being a warrior unit means that it's over and done very, very quickly in the game. It does not take very long to get to, to swordmen at all. Like it just swordmen are just around the corner from the beginning of the game. So you're really going to have to do as much as you can as early in the game as possible. Now they do get a bonus for attacking stronger units, which does mean a warrior versus another, like a swordman might, especially with a couple promotions, might be able to hold his own. Um, so maybe this allows you to ignore the swordman a little bit. Um, but yeah, let's get to the butt. <laughs> let's get to the butt. What is more expensive to train? Go okay, more expensive to train is not that big of a deal. I mean, it. let me rephrase that. It is, it is a big deal because early game production is so incredibly valuable. It's not a big deal because presumably, and we won't know until we actually get in there and see it, you know, some of the stats, presumably it, it could be cheaper than, well, if it's cheaper than the swordman, even though it's more expensive than a warrior, and it could still kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the swordman because going against the swordman, it actually gets more combat strength, then maybe in the long run, especially if it doesn't require iron, maybe it actually ends up being a better unit. Um, I'm not 100% convinced, if I must be honest, but I'm hoping that... My assumptions are correct. We'll find out, you know, once we get there. And by the way, I don't even know what this is yet. She hasn't said anything. This looks like a page out of Asterix and Obelix, if you ask me. I just, I'm, I'm missing the obelisk. Oh, no, there it is. There it is. There is one. Right? That, that's an obelisk right there. <laughs> is that? Please tell me that. I'm not just making that up because I want it to be one. <laughs> or all these obelisks. I thought those were trees, actually, at first. I think those might be trees, but I think that's an obelisk. This looks literally looks like a page out of Asterix and Obelix. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm so sorry. You should look it up because, yeah. Um, yeah. Paul's unique district is called the Opidum. It's not only cheaper and available earlier than the industrial zone, but also unlocks the apprenticeship technology when constructed. Highly defensible, it offers its own ranged attack and receives a major adjacency bonus from quarries and strategic resources. Wow. An industrial zone available earlier, cheaper, unlocks the tech, you know, you know, gives you the bonus for a tech. Or wait, did she say it unlocks or just gives you the bonus? Gaul's unique district is called the Opido. It's not only cheaper and available earlier than the industrial zone, but also unlocks the apprenticeship technology when constructed. It legit it actually unlocks it. Like it just uh, that's what that means, right? That's not like just gets you the bonus. It legitimately unlocks it. Wow. And then it's got its own defense. <laughs> okay. I mean, this guy's going to have production coming out of his ears. Um, not a lot of science necessarily, because if you're going to have some trouble with those adjacency bonuses or a culture, again, adjacency bonus, potential trouble. Now, if you have hills literally everywhere, then maybe those are, those are okay. But wow. Okay. This is interesting. Its own defense. And I love, like I said, I love the way it looks. It's awesome. Okay, okay. I'm liking this so far, I think. I think. Highly defensible, it offers its own ranged attack and receives a major adjacency bonus from quarries and strategic resources. Ambiorix's ability is called King of the Elbirwans. King of the Elbirwans, as she said. Uh, okay, so... Your civilization gains culture equal to 20% of the unit's cost when a non-civilian unit is trained. So a military unit is trained. Um, you get 20% of the cost back as culture. Awesome. Melee, anti-cavalry, and ranged units receive plus two combat strength for every adjacent combat unit. So uh, at most that would be what... To be fair, it only says adjacent combat unit. It doesn't say adjacent combat friendly unit, but I, I sh surely it's friendly unit, right? I would think um, that would be at most. Let's say it's a, let's assume it is friendly units only, and you can stick a unit next to to uh, another unit, right? And then you have the other five squares occupied. So it's a plus ten combat strength, presumably. Now um, a ranged unit could have up to I guess a plus twelve because they could be completely surrounded and still fire off their shot. So melee, anti cavalry, and ranged units could potentially have as much as a plus twelve. Now you are going to want to have relatively large militaries because you want enough adjacency to make this you know worthwhile 
Um, if you have just a couple units, two, two, two or three units, you're just not getting much of a bonus there. Interesting. And the culture, now the culture, what that's going to do is, I mean, this is not, this is not a culture victory civilization from what I'm seeing right here. But what that does is it lets you progress through the culture tree uh, a little quicker without having to focus on culture specifically. And it incentivizes you to train a lot of military units. You want to train a lot of cheap, you know, maybe not cheap, I don't know, because it's 20% of the units cost. So just a lot of military units throughout the game. You want to keep training those because you're going to keep getting those little culture, you know, chunks here and there um, to kind of help you push through the culture tree while you focus on other things. Interesting. All right. And then the Hallstrott culture. Uh, mines provide minor adjacency bonus for all districts, a culture bomb of unknown unowned territory and receive plus one culture so yeah just the flat culture so he's going to get culture from his mines which is going to be a decent chunk and he's going to get culture bombs now the culture from the mines does that mean and i assume it does because when you research what is it flight uh, improvements that have culture on them turn into uh, tourism and so if he's got culture on his mines he actually is going to get some tourism from those from those mines so maybe a culture victory is not as far-fetched as i thought at first i don't think the first bonus points to a culture victory this bonus not directly but it could help if that is something that you want to pursue i still don't think it's a strength of his but i think this would obviously could help in some manner he's just gonna have a lot of good culture though he's gonna be able to progress through the culture tree the civics tree maybe get to those um cores and those armies and things like that a lot quicker get some of those better governments things like that so i think he's gonna be able to progress but i still i'm still not just like reading um culture victory necessarily I'm not saying it's impossible but just not necessarily jumping out at me uh then you got his unit ancient era unit that replaces the warrior unit has increased cost and received plus 10 combat strength when fighting units with a higher base combat strength it also gets plus five combat strength versus district defenses that's pretty cool so it's going to help you take out some of those you know uh, other cities and things like that and the open them a district unit the gall that's cheaper and available earlier than district replaces the industrial zone that is awesome the open -dome district is defensible with a range attack. When the first open -dome is constructed, the apprenticeship technology is unlocked. Plus two production bonus if adjacent to a quarry improvement or strategic resource. He's going to have tons of production, which is great because he's going to want to build lots of units. Obviously, he's going to have lots of units. What's he going to want to do with those units? He's going to go to a war. Con I mean, this is another conquest, you know, like a, a domination victory uh, type of civilization. Not saying he can't do the other, other ones, but... Everything points to some sort of domination, although that increased production will help you, you know, like a space victory late game or let's say some of those um, diplomacy victory, uh, like the, the, the competitions and things like that, the world competitions. Uh, he's going to have a lot of production for those as well. So I think diplomacy is in his cards. I think science could be, although he doesn't have a specific science bonus other than go take a couple of cities that can kind of help you build up some science uh, and then you'll have that big production towards the end game. Uh, and then he's going to have, like I said, potentially uh, a culture victory. But it's, I still think that's a little bit of a stretch. I think it's domination is first. I would say probably diplomacy would be second. Because, again, there's no direct um, science bonus here. And then, you know, science and culture might be kind of tied for each other down there at the bottom. Uh, religion, there's literally nothing here for religion. Unless, yeah, because religious units, do they count as a civilian? I actually don't know. I forget. I know they're on a, a different layer than normal civilian units. I don't know if they count as civilian units, though, for this. So we'll have to find that out. But I guess you wouldn't be producing, though, right? Uh, you would still train. So I don't know. I honestly don't know how that works. Well, to say that I assume it doesn't. That would be my guess. But I'm not, it's possible, I suppose. But I still don't see this being a, a religious uh, civilization. So I think religion's completely out. I think science and culture are at the bottom. And I think it's domination first, diplomacy probably second. It grants Gaul additional culture based on unit cost when a non-civilian unit is trained. It also gives melee, anti-cavalry, and ranged units bonus combat strength for every adjacent combat unit. Gaul's focus is on a defensive, culture and production-centered game. Prioritize border expansion early so you have room to build districts far from the city center. Claim as many mines as possible to fuel this expansion with Gaul's culture bombing ability. Place the Opidum to guard valuable resources in your sprawling city. Also, consider rushing military tradition for flanking bonuses. That makes sense. Which can combine with Gaul's horde based combat buffs to forge a truly formidable army. Will you undermine your enemies to reign in all directions? How will you lead Gaul in Sid Meier's Civilization VI? 
All right. So yeah, I mean, can he go culture? Maybe I'm maybe I'm discounting how much tourism he could get from those mines. Uh, and the other thing I'm discounting, to be fair, and again, this is this is just the nature of me playing on deity difficulty all the time, and just it is such a huge challenge to build any wonders at all. If you're playing on any pretty much any difficulty less than deity, um, wonders are very much you know in the cards, able to build whatever. So if you're playing on anything less than deity, for sure. I could see going for a culture victory in that case because you are going to get tons of production to be able to pump out some wonders. Uh, you're going to have some space to put some wonders because you're going to be spreading your districts out anyway. So that could help, um, you know, surround your your uh, your theater district with a bunch of wonders or something like that. You know, obviously wonders have space um, restrictions themselves. But um, so I could definitely see that. I think deity, it, it's still possible because you're going to get a lot of production and you are going to be able to catch up with the production that the other civilizations have to be able to start building some of those wonders before them. So I do think it is still possible to go culture with, um, with him. You know, he is again, presumably going to get some, um, some, uh, what I'm trying to say, tourism from his mines and stuff like that, which he should have plenty of. So I guess culture is probably a little bit better than I'm thinking again, especially on anything lower than deity. I think it's very, very much in the cards because you're gonna be able to build lots of wonders. So there you go. Domination, um, diplomacy, probably like i said culture and i would say science is down at the bottom but again that production can help with a late game science push if you can get there it's just a matter of getting there because you just don't have anything directly helping your science rate itself so cool i don't know it does look like an interesting civilization to play with uh the whole horde mentality is definitely i think uh, you see that played out here although sometimes late game you just don't need hordes of units you just need a couple units you know a couple siege units and a couple melee units and you're done so i could see how that bonus could sort of die off at some point because it's just not necessary at some point in the game but definitely early game i think those hordes will definitely make a difference especially when you're still using ranged units to uh to kind of help siege down stuff it's gonna be interesting I, personally i would say i could even see a, a a strategy where you just use your early game horde to spread your borders out to kind of take some of those nearby neighbors out settle into some some decent sized chunk of land and then just settle down with your advantage that you've just now, you know, kind of carved out of the world and maybe go, like I said, diplomacy or, or, or culture at that point. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Uh, do you like these guys? Do you think these guys are going to be fun to play with? What strategy are you going to go with? And what kind of victory are you going to go with? Uh, and yeah, let me know. I do appreciate you guys watching though. May God bless you. And I hope you join me again next time. Thank you and goodbye.